What did you do with the intercom? In front of the dryer. Okay, so today we're going to look at chapter eight, and um, if I can get my share screen to work. Okay, so this is all on drug information references. And that is chapter seven in your book. And so your book talks about um, all of the references and I have, um, I have examples of a couple of them here that I can show you guys too. Now, before, you know, we had the internet. I know, I'm that old. I do remember when it wasn't uh, something that everybody could just access. We had these things oh, called books, and they were so much easier to lug around than the entire internet. No, of course not. But they had a lot of really good information in them. And I like to tell the story when my son was doing a research project on, uh, it was uh, English literature. It was probably about 10 years ago. And so we did have computer access and the internet. Um, but we also have a set of 1956 Collier's encyclopedias that I've had in my family since I was a child. And so he needed some information on this Lord that had written a novel or something. And so I said, why don't you check the encyclopedia? And he said, mom, I have the internet. So he goes online and he Googles this guy. And I said, okay, have you started yet? And he said, yes. And I went and grabbed the book, the correct book with that last name. And not only did I find it quicker than he found it on the internet, um, my encyclopedia had about three pages of information, including how he died, this Lord, um, that was not on the internet on any of the sources that he found. So I thought that was just interesting. That just made my day like, oh, look, old fashioned book had more information. So um, that we always laugh about that. It was kind of funny. And now he likes to show me how all of that information, including the death, um, I guess this guy drowned in his, on his estate in his own pond. And so he likes to tell me, look, it's all on the internet now. Well, that's true. Everything is pretty much on the internet now. Yes, Bruce is here. Bruce wants to say hi. Um, the thing with the internet is, of course, as you guys all know, you're gonna get all kinds of information and a lot of information is not only going to be incorrect, some of it's gonna be complete fantasy. And so that's not going to help you with, um, with drug references. And especially since people have strong opinions about drugs in general, and there's so many conspiracy theories out there and people are saying, oh no, you must do the natural thing, which, you know, I'm, I'm not rolling my eyes, natural is wonderful. Um, unless it prevents you from um, getting help that saves your life. Like for instance, if I'm having a heart attack, I'm not going to go out and, you know, try to find an herb that uh, contains foxglove or whatever. You know what I mean? We have to be able to work quickly and save someone's life. So I'm, yes, it is better to um, live a healthy lifestyle and watch your weight and eat foods that are good for you and not smoke and not um, not live in an area where there are a lot of forest fires. Hello, you know, some things we can't help. Um, so we have to have drugs and I'm not going to get into that whole thing, but we have to be able to use reference sources. So when you're looking online, you want to avoid, honestly, like the first three to five answers that come up on a Google search are going to be ads. And then the next few um, sources that come up might have infer interesting information. So you really got to look at what is that source that I'm going to click on. And you know, some of it is just spam and some of it are ads and some of it could even be malware. So you got to be real careful what you click on. Um, so I do love books. I love the old fashioned, you know, books themselves with paper. And especially if they have a leather binding, it's just, 
you know, it's wonderful. There's nothing like the smell of a new book with the ink and the paper and everything. But, um, and of course, some of the older books just smell dusty because people don't dust them. Um, so let's look at a lot of these reference sources. We have to be able to use them because we have to have information in the pharmacy. Now, when we, um, there's one I use a lot. Uh, in fact, there's two that I use a lot, and I'll tell you about those as we go along. So when you're researching a drug, you have to ask yourself, what am I looking for? I don't know why my chair is so low today. Let me see if I can pick it up a little bit. Oh, no, helped a little bit. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, why am I looking for information, and what information do I need? Do I need to know just the generic name of the drug? Because you can Google that really easily and you don't even have to click on the source, it usually comes up. Do I need the interactions with other drugs? What's the classification? Or what does the drug look like if it's a tablet or a capsule? So then you have to ask yourself which reference source is gonna be the most appropriate. So that's why we have to know what these sources are. So, um, the way that they classify these drugs, every drug will have a monograph. And a monograph is sort of like a diary of the drug, like everything, or, or it's um, autobiography. It's everything about that drug, the classifications, the um, like, is it an antiviral? Is it an antibiotic? So that's the classification. So um, when drug companies come up with new drugs and they have to go through an experimental stage where they do all kinds of checking to see what they think it might do. And a lot of times what they do is they'll take an existing drug um, like um, loratadine, which is um, you know, a sinus uh, medication, um, it's Claritin. And then they'll say, maybe we can get something that's similar and honestly, I think the drug company did this so they could come out with a new drug and keep it brand name for a while. Um, and then they look at the chemical structure of the molecule and they come up with something that's similar. Sometimes it'll be the left hand of that molecule, you know, like if the molecule looks like this, they'll flip it around and see if they can come up with something that looks like that. Or they may switch a couple of the places on the atoms on the molecule. So then they have a, a different drug and the structure will be the same it's going to have the same like legos if you have like 17 legos you can put those together in all kinds of orders but they're still going to be the same 17 legos right so if you're looking at drugs most of them will contain carbon they all have hydrogen stuck out to all the little areas where there's nothing attached a lot of them will have nitrogen um and uh, a lot of the same similar atoms that are that you find in drugs. And all of these same atoms are still found, you know, all over the place in nature. So if you look at it that way, it's the way that these atoms are put together, which is the chemical structure that makes it a particular drug, right? Because you could, you know, you can have flour and sugar and eggs and milk and water, and you can make a cake or you can make biscuits or you can make gravy with those things. So, and they're not always gonna be the same thing, right? Okay. So uh, the drug company comes up with a, a monograph and they submit it, somebody's walking by outside so the dogs are gonna bark. They submit it to the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. And the Food and Drug Administration has to look it over and then approve it or not approve it in order for it to be sold in the US. So the classification puts it into a category based on its chemical structure, what the mechanism of action is, which means how does it work in the body, and or the therapeutic uses. So for therapeutic uses, we're talking about what is the good thing that the drug company wants this drug to do or says that it will do. Um, and then the indications are the conditions for which the drug is used. So in the case of say loratadine, it is an antihistamine, that's its classification, and it's used for um, all of the uh, symptoms of allergy, like runny nose, um, sinus pressure, um, itching, rash, hives, that type of thing, okay? So that's the indication. And then the company that, that came up with this drug um, is the founding company, and it also gives it a trade name or a brand name. 
So the word trade name, brand name, proprietary name, those are all the same thing, and that is Claritin for this particular drug. Now, Claritin has been on the market for more than 20 or 30 years, so um, it's also available in generic because when the FDA um, approves the drug, it gets a patent on the name. In fact, they can get the patent on the name before they even... Um, before they even get approval to market it. So they have, there's lots and lots of drugs, drugs out there or chemical combinations that aren't even approved for use because they either abandon them because it didn't pass clinical trials or because they're still in clinical trials. So they can get the, the patent on that and then no one else can make it and sell it as a drug um, until the patent runs out. So most of the time they get a 20 year patent and we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so then they give the drug a uh, brand name. Now, for, um, for our purposes, a chemical name is a long list of the chemicals that are in this particular drug. And it's a long name, and many times there'll be numbers in that name as well as, um, as letters. So then we look at the generic name. So for most generic names, they'll have um, either a prefix or a suffix in the word. So for instance, most chemical names for beta blockers end in O-L-O-L, -L, or sometimes A-L-O-L. -L. So um, beta blockers are drugs that block the beta cells in, the, um, in a lot of times in the heart and, and that area and the, and the arteries from constricting. Okay, so they stop it from constricting, so they lower blood pressure. They block the chemicals that make the, the arteries and veins constrict, and so that keeps them relaxed, and it keeps the blood flowing without high blood pressure. Okay, um, so if drug names end in LOL, then they're probably a beta blocker. So drugs like labetalol, which is normadine, and uh, propranolol, which is enderol. So, and there's probably 10 or 11 of them. Uh, Carvetolol, um, and I can't think of all of them right now, but a lot of them are in your book, Drug References for Health Professions, which we're gonna talk about at the end of this list of references. Okay, um, so most of the reference books, okay, so the monographs are also called package inserts. And those are the papers that come folded and stuck to the top of the drugs. The monographs um, list all kinds of information. And we're gonna go over monographs in a little bit because we have a monograph exercise to do. Um, so most of the reference books list the trade and generic names of the drugs, their indications, the classifications, the contraindications, um, Contra indications would mean things that you should, they, they should not use it, reasons why they shouldn't use it. So for instance, if the patient already has, um, I don't know, low blood pressure, then maybe they shouldn't use a blood pressure medication that's going to make them extra sleepy or lower their blood pressure too much. Or let's say that they have high blood pressure, they should not use a drug that increases their blood pressure even more, okay? So that's a contraindication. Um, so the reference book will also list the dosage strengths, the dosage forms, and some reference books will list a price, but there's really only one that does that because prices are continually fluctuating. Contraindications identify the types of people who should not be given these medications, like for instance, people with high blood pressure. And I think these page numbers are wrong. So I just want to make sure on this. This says page 161 and let me see where it is. Okay, it is on page 161, box 7-1 on page 161. Trade names can reflect the drug's primary characteristics or use, but cannot imply a cure of a specific part of the body. So for instance, low pressure 
or low presser, sorry, low presser is a brand name of a drug that lowers blood pressure. Another one is low tensin, which is, um, tensin refers to hypertension. So low tensin lowers blood pressure. Lipitor lowers blood lipids or fats in the bloods and those raise cholesterol. So Lipitor is, Lipitor was um, one of the most popular drugs for the last 10 years because um, it lowers cholesterol. Restoril treats insomnia when people can't sleep or it conveys restfulness, et cetera. So they can give it a brand name. And a lot of times what the drug companies do now is they bring in a focus group and they'll say, we have this drug named, uh, the generic name is, and it could be something really weird, you know, uh, like carisoprodol. And then they'll say, so we want something that makes it sound like this will help people sleep. And they came up with the name Soma for that particular drug because Soma in Greek or Latin, I don't remember which, it's probably similar, um, means to sleep. Okay, um, generic names will have a suffix. Now, really, really old generic names didn't follow this rule. In fact, aspirin has no brand name. The brand name, because it was, um, aspirin was discovered as a compound in the 50s in the bark of a willow tree. And Native Americans were using it for years to treat fever and pain. Uh, you know, probably thousands of years to treat fever and pain, they would make a tea with willow bark in it and it would help patients with fever or with pain. Um, but that particular, you might think, oh, well, why don't we just keep making willow bark tea? It tears up the stomach. It is so, it causes ulcers. So it's really not good to just drink lots of willow bark tea. I mean, sure, it's okay to drink, drink it now and then, but if you do it continuously, just like taking aspirin, it can cause ulcers. So when um, this, this chemist for the Bayer company came up with it, um, he called it aspirin, and they didn't have in those days a generic name and a brand name. It was just Bayer aspirin. And so that's, the Bayer was the drug company that he either worked for them or he sold it to them. I don't remember which. Okay. Now, a lot of generic names typically do not begin with J or W. There's a couple exceptions. One of them is warfarin. And in some countries, they call it Vorferin because the W and the V are pretty much the same letter in a lot of languages. Um, so J and W letters don't necessarily exist in languages of a lot of countries. So we don't have a lot of generic names that start with those with J or W. So looking at the suffixes, which is the end of the word, A-L-O-L or O-L-O-L, are beta blockers like atenolol, natalol, timolol, propranolol, and you know, like I said, there's a bunch of them. The generic names that end in pril, P-R-I-L, those are ACE inhibitors. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, and it blocks it or inhibits the conversion of angiotensin into tensin, which squeezes the blood vessel. So if it inhibits it, it keeps it open. So those are things like enalapril, lisinopril, and captopril, and there's quite a few others too. If it ends in psyllin, it could be an antibiotic or it could possibly be a drug used to treat things like cancer. So for our purposes, we're gonna say that psyllins are derivatives of penicillin. So there's quite a few of them, ampicillin, amoxicillin, um, and there's a few others out there. So on page 161, um, box 7.2, which is not on there. Okay, I don't know where that went. But anyway, we have those reference books listed. And then some other examples are in suffixes, prefixes, and root words. And that takes you to a website that will show you some of, of those things. Okay, so we have to be comfortable using basic drug and pharmacy references. Now, having said this, I know that the first thing that most people under, let's say under 40, because I'm over 40, sorry, um, most, the most popular thing or the most logical thing they're going to do is Google the drug name, okay? But you want to 
not do that unless it's your last resort. Because again, like I told you, you're going to come up with 25 different things that will not answer your question. And if you grab your drug reference source and you know your drug reference sources, you can find it a lot quicker actually using books. So a lot of drug references are available online, um, but it says technicians should use caution, obviously. Now, some of these legitimate reference sources, this is my favorite one. This is Drug Facts and Comparisons. This is a wonderful book. It's been around for more than 50 years. Um, it has an online subscription. The only problem is you have to pay for that subscription and it gets quite pricey. Um, so, uh, if you work for a pharmacy that pays for that subscription, then you can just log into there and get the information you want, and it's pretty quick. Um, but also, you know, if you just buy the book, it's sometimes cheaper than the subscription. The reason I have sources like this is because it belonged to someone who got the new ish, the new um, edition, and then they were going to throw away the old one. And I was like, it's a book. Why are you throwing it away? Don't throw it away. You know, because that just um, is, is just horror to me. So I ended up, you know, uh, being given these sources and now I have them here. I don't have a lot of them, but, and a lot of what I have is old because they're part of my book collection that I've had for years. Okay, so Drug Facts and Comparisons, that's this book right here. It comes in an edition that's similar to a photo album because it comes apart and it's, and it's got a post system here that you can pull the post out and then all the pages are loose and then you can replace pages if you want. Now this is the only one, the only source that if you subscribe to it, it sends you monthly updates. And it also gives you access to its online source, which you don't have to take old pages out and put new pages in. This is not that type of book. This one is just a bound book from the year 2000. So it's, you know, 20 years out of date, but um, it still has interesting information in it. And a lot of the drugs that are in there are still around and the information is still current. So this is the only one that you can update. It's available to be updated monthly if you buy that form. And Drug Facts and Comparisons is the one that uh, my pharmacist, Tammy Estes, used to call it the great big book of everything. It lists the indications, dosage strengths, dosage form sizes and manufacturers. It has a comparison of strengths of, um, of different steroids. So doctors can see which steroid is the best for which condition. Um, and on table 71 on page 162, see if I can find that. I'm finding it. It's actually on Page 156 talks about drug facts and comparison. So there's the five sections contained in it. Um, it comes in hardback, loose leaf hardback, pocket size, or electronic subscription. Then we have a physician's desk reference, the PDR. Now, uh, I don't like the PDR, and I'll tell you why. I have very strong opinions, and I apologize for sharing opinions that other people might not agree with. PDR is used mainly by physicians because the monographs are kind of complex. That's not why it's used by physicians. It's used by physicians because drug companies come and bring it to physicians for free because the sections in there are listed that only list the ones that the drug companies want listed. So the PDR is kind of like an ad. Um, Physician's desk reference, I don't know, there must be a law somewhere that says that all physician's offices have to have a PDR because it's in the bookshelf on all of the doctor's offices that I have ever visited. Um, and it has six sections and it's updated yearly. It lists only FDA approved drugs and it provides a complete description of the drug, including its chemical structure and study results. It's a compilation of package inserts 
with additional sections for pregnancy categories. So pregnancy categories are um, something that's really important that I'm going to uh, add a file to. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I write that down. Pregnancy category files. Okay, because there are quite a few drugs that are not safe. Most of the drugs are not safe in pregnancy. So, um, but there's reasons why pregnant women might have to take certain drugs. And some, there's a few drugs that are safe to take during pregnancy, for instance, prenatal vitamins and say a woman has low thyroid. It's extremely important that she takes thyroid supplements in order to support the pregnancy. So um, this PDR will also give the um, pregnancy categories also. It also has poison control numbers and other quick references, but since it comes out every year, the addition that the doctor has on the shelf, um, that information might be a year old. This is also available in elect uh, electronic form. In fact, most of these references are now available in electronic form. The Drug Topics Red Book, it is red, um, it's a paperback, and it's a good source of information on drug costs, and it's presented in the form of quick referencing charts, examples, drugs that should not be crushed, sugar-free and alcohol-free drugs, drugs that are excreted in breast milk. It has tables showing pharmacy calculations and also dosing instructions translated into Spanish. There's 10 sections in the Red Book. Um, drug reimbursement, and which is how much um, insurance companies will pay for a drug, and herbal referencing can also be found. Community pharmacies are very likely to use this book. Any uh, pharmacy that deals directly with the public, like community pharmacies, they're also called retail pharmacies or ambulatory pharmacies, where the patient walks in with a prescription. Um, so the ten, there's 10 sections of the Drug Topics Red Book, and I'm not sure if it's on page 164. And it is not, but it is in there, I believe it's on page 156. And it's also available in soft cover and electronic formats. It's like a large paperback. Okay, the Orange Book is no longer in book form. What this is, it lists the FDA approved drugs, all the, all the drugs that are approved by the FDA with their therapeutic equivalence evaluation. So the orange book, again, it's no longer a book, but it can be accessed online for free. This book lists which drugs the FDA says are okay in their generic form is basically what the orange book is. They're approved, um, which drugs are approved with their therapeutic equivalents. So it also determines whether a generic drug is the same as a brand name drug. It includes discontinued drug products, orphan product designations and approvals list. Orphan drugs are drugs that are developed for rare diseases. Now, if let's say that you have somebody with, it used to be like the bubble boy disease where they have no um, immunity. That is an extremely rare disease. And we had fewer, at one point, we had fewer than 20 patients in the entire United States that had that disease when it, when it first became known. Um, and maybe other people had it, but didn't know it and didn't live long and they didn't know why. So the, um, the government decided to throw some money at a drug company in order to make a drug to treat this rare disease. So those drugs are called orphan drugs because the companies that make these drugs, it costs a lot of money to develop a drug. So if they're only going to sell it to 20 people, why should they make it? And they won't make it if, unless they get sponsorship. So that's, those are orphan drugs. Uh, Orange Book is updated annually and can be assessed online for free access to free online. Okay, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia or pharmacopoeia is a word that has a lot of vowels in it. It does not have a U. It has the A, E, O, and I in it. Um, and it is from Greek and Latin. And it basically means everything pharmacy, but that's not the way we take it to mean. What we take it to mean is a giant list of drugs. So, um, 
For the US, there's something called a national formulary, and this comes out in a book form. The USP national formulary provides access to the official standards of the FDA. It serves as a guide to the specifications, the test procedures, and acceptance uh, criteria that are required for pharmaceutical manufacturing and quality control. So you've seen ads for things like, um, you know, um, supplements, right? Like for arthritis and different things like that. Um, so um, Romano, I don't have access to chat while I'm showing the PowerPoint. So you can unmute by pressing the space bar and you can ask me a question if you need to. Okay, um, so when they say that, uh, that a supplement has been approved by USP, it basically means that the FDA doesn't think that it's harmful. It doesn't necessarily mean they think it's great, right? Because they don't make those uh, type of judgment calls. They don't say something is good or bad. So the USP and app is available in hardback, electronic form, and online subscriptions. And it also has the most recent sterile preparation guidelines for USP 797. This came out, oh, I'm trying to remember, it's probably been about five years ago that we, that we had to start following USP 797. Um, that is guidelines that have to do with preparing sterile drugs uh, in sterile conditions. Now they're coming out with a new one uh, called USP 800, and they already have most of it listed. Things like uh, how sterile the room has to be in the compounding area, how sterile the air has to be in the ante area, which is right outside the compounding area, things like that. So USP 800 is gonna be even tougher so, um, so that we make drugs in, in very sterile conditions. Um, it also includes the most common non-formulary agents, things that are not necessarily on the USP formulary, but it um, lists things that other countries use. Because there are a lot of drugs that are used in countries like Germany um, and a lot of other countries that we don't necessarily use in the US because they're not approved yet. Um, it also includes things like veterinary compounding drugs, dietary supplements, and laws pertaining to compounding. For instance, if I'm going to make pills in a pill mold, which is a square aluminum or stainless steel plate with holes in it to put stuff in that will turn it into a pill form after it dries, well, one of the laws says that I need to completely clean it after I make one pill before I make another pill. So you'd think, oh, well, that's just common sense. You should clean your equipment. But believe it or not, some countries don't um, enforce those laws. And some unscrupulous owners could be hurrying people up and not giving them time to properly clean, clean between batches of, say, tablets. So, um, you know, that type of thing is listed in this US pharmacopoeia, mainly so that they can go after companies that don't uh, allow their employees time to clean and they can get in trouble for it. So, you know, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Uh, clinical pharmacology and gold standard and also some Elsevier products. So I have to throw out here that Elsevier is the publisher of your textbook. There's two publishing companies that I really like their textbooks. Um, and Elsevier is one of them. There's only one book that I use a lot of that's not Elsevier. Um, but also Elsevier uses Mosby products and I love Mosby products. Um, Mosby's has been around for over a hundred years and they, um, they do a really good job of preventing, presenting drug information, okay? So this uh, gold standard, clinical pharmacology, is recognized by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It should be CMMS, but they always just call it CMS, um, due to its extensive drug information, including off-label drug uses supported by clinical evidence. Uh, their data is continuously updated. The database is called the MicroMedx Drug Dex. Now, the hospital I work at has a subscription to Micromedx. So if I'm at work, I can actually look things up um, using Micromedx, and it is really a good source of drug information. 
Um, it also contains safety data sheets. Um, material safety data sheets, or TOXED, are also included. Now, material safety data sheets, now by material we mean chemicals, okay? So the safety data sheets um, have five sections, at least five sections, that tell you about this thing. Like for instance, let's say we're talking about um, alcohol that we use to clean the pharmacy, isopropyl alcohol. Every company that makes isopropyl alcohol has to come out with a safety data sheet that tells whoever's handling it how to store it. Like for instance, you would not store isopropyl alcohol next to a hot water heater because it, there's a, a chance, very low chance, but there's a chance that it could get overheated and explode. Um, isopropyl alcohol can catch on fire. It can burn your eyes if it gets in your eyes. Um, and so we have these safety data sheets for it. The funny thing is, I think it's hilarious, there is a safety data sheet for Purell hand sanitizer. Now that safety data sheet says that if you have skin contact, you should wash it with soap and water. <laughs> but basically what it means, because it's meant to be applied to your skin, right? Purell hand sanitizer, you put it on your hand and then you do your hand sanitizing with it, covering all surfaces of every finger, et cetera, et cetera, the palms of your hands, the backs of your hands between your fingers. Okay, um, and under your nails even, your fingertips. But some people are allergic to it, and some people can use too much of it and dries their skin out and cracks it. So in that case, that's where you would do the wash it off with soap and water if it bothers your hand. But I think it's just hilarious that it says if you get it on your skin to wash it off with soap and water because you're supposed to put it on your skin. Okay. So those are material safety data sheets. I once compiled... Um, a notebook with over 400 of them for a school pharmacy lab, not the one we're in now. Okay, there's something called Identidrug. Identidrug came about because people would find tablets and capsules and not know what they were. So the most common thing would, that would happen in my experience is we would get a call from a mom of a teenager. And the mom would say, I found this pill in my son's pocket and I don't know what it is and I'm afraid he's been offered drugs at school. So we would be like, okay, what does it look like? Well, it's round and it's white. That tells us nothing. So, um, Identidrug is a reference book with more than 7,000 listings in it because obviously you can't identify a cough syrup by look. You know, it, it could be pink, it could be red, could be green, could be blue, we don't know. Um, but tablets and capsules you can usually identify because they have to be a certain shape and color and they have to have markings on them. So using the shape, the color, and the marking, we can usually figure out what a drug is. So it's used a lot in emergency departments to identify the drugs on which a patient has overdosed if a tablet or capsule is brought in with the patient. So um, Commonly what's happening in the high school scenario is that say a young woman will take something for cramps and then her friend will give it to her. And then her friend, you know, will say here, take another one in case it hurts later and they'll put it in their pocket and they'll go home and the mother will find it. And it turns out to be something like pamperin or ibuprofen. So um, the problem with that is pamperin contains pamabrom, which is a, uh, a very mild diuretic, which is why it was over the counter. I don't even know if they still sell it or not. But if you take a lot of them, it can cause people to feel a little bit loopy or high. So even young men were taking pamperin just to get high. Okay, so here's an example of Identidrug. Um, this is how these drug identifiers work. This is from Clinical Pharmacy. And so you can see that this is a round purple tablet and it has CPC and FL on it. And it turns out that this is a fluoride chewable tablet from Cypress uh, Manufacturing, Cypress Pharmaceutical Inc. So this is how these pill identifiers work. And now there are quite a few of them online that actually show the pictures. But Identidrug was the first book that had this information in it. Okay, Micromedex is that, um, 
that reference source from the clinical pharmacology, okay? So it's an online and mobile application. You can put an app on your phone with it. Healthcare facilities use it. And the information is provided through several different software programs that can be purchased, including DrugDex or PDR, or Index Nominum for International Drugs. Because remember, people come visit here from all over the world, and then they bring medications with them from other countries, and sometimes people will find those and not know what they are. So you have your Index Nominum. Trissel's Handbook on Injectable Drugs. I have a copy of this one, and this is one that I use a lot in the pharmacy, but it's, there's a paperback version that is not this heavy. Handbook on Injectable Drugs, originally written by Lawrence A. Trissel. It's now been updated many years. This is the 16th edition, which is a really old one. Well, it's not that old, actually. Let me see what the publication date on this is. This is from 2011. So for me, that's not that long ago, but some of you might think that that's really old. Um, so it lists drugs that are injectable drugs. It has their solubility information. If it is a drug that has to be reconstituted, it tells you how to reconstitute it and what the powder volume is. And for me, that's extremely important because when I'm preparing an IV, um, I need to know how many milliliters will give me the amount of drug that I need to put in an IV because you don't always put the whole vial, especially for children, in, um, in an IV and I, I work in a children's hospital. So I use that at least three or four times a week. Um, so it provides information on IV medications and the compatibility of various agents given parenterally. Parenterally means injected. So they have monographs that discuss the products, their administration, their stability, and their compatibility with infusion solutions and other drugs. Because you don't want to keep poking holes in patients. You don't want to keep putting vein uh, IV lines in people. So if they have a vein here, and this is a common uh, place to put an IV um, for a woman in labor. They'll use the back of her hand. Well, you don't want to do another one at the crook of her arm and another one, say, in the jugular vein. <laughs> it's just, you know, and you don't want to put a pick line, which comes here and then goes to the heart, um, if you don't have to. Why poke them more than they should already be poked, right? So if you're going to give a drug and then administer another drug, the drugs are going to come into contact with each other. And are they going to form a precipitate, which could cause um, a blood clot, which could cause a heart attack or a stroke and kill people. So drug compatibility in IV lines is extremely important. The American Drug Index contains listings for more than 22,000 drugs, both prescription and over-the-counter. This right here, 22,000 drugs, this comes up on national exams a lot, which publication gives a listing for more than 22,000 drugs. It's the American Drug Index. Or the question could read, the American Drug Index contains listings for more than blank drugs. And then if you look down A, B, C, and D, it says 2,000, 22,000, 220,000. So it's it, you know confusing you on purpose. So that's something you should probably memorize. American Drug Index information includes the manufacturer's names, how to pronounce the drug names, active ingredients, dosage forms and strengths, packaging and uses, drugs that should not be crushed or chewed, look-alike and sound-alike drugs. Those are called LASA drugs, L-A-S-A, look-alike or sound-alike, and storage requirements for USP drugs. Um, remember, United States Pharmacopeia. The drug index is available in hardback or electronic format because we're finally moving ahead with the times. Goodman and Gilman's, the pharmacological basis of therapeutics. So some of the information that's in this particular publication, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, and those things are very important um, and they're different from each other. And one of your questions in your book is what's the difference between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics? So I'll let you guys check that out. Drug transport, drug metabolism, and principles of therapeutics in all areas of the body system. This is available in hardback or an online subscription. 
the Handbook of Non-Prescription Drugs. This is for people who maybe don't see the doctor, they have a headache, and they want to know what will help treat their headache. So this provides self-care options for non-prescription medications, nutritional supplements, medical foods, you know, foods that people eat that do things in the body. Complementary and alternative therapies, where we have a whole chapter on complementary and alternative therapies. I believe it's chapter uh, 29 or 30, chapter 30. So we're going to talk about that a little more. What's the difference between complementary and alternative? Um, it also includes non-drug and preventive measures for self-treatable disorders, FDA-approved dosing information, and evidence-based research on efficacy and safety. So this is really important. Just because somebody says, Manny, no, stop that. Somebody says, you know, I had a headache and I took this and my headache went away. So now, and it could be something like, oh, I ate a grape, some, some weird thing, right? Now, they're going to tell everybody, if you have a headache, eat a grape, it will take your headache away. And you can find that kind of stuff on the internet. What that's called is anecdotal evidence. Anecdote means it's a story. An anecdote is a short story. Um, does that mean that it's going to work on everybody's headache? Of course not. Of course not. Just because that person took, you know, ate a grape, and now their headache is gone, that doesn't mean that grapes are a cure for headache. In fact, some people might take it so far as to think maybe I'll drink wine, and then some people get a headache if they drink wine. And I am one of those people. So um, I definitely know that uh, wine is not a good headache cure, at least not for me, it makes it worse. So um, when you look at these things, we wanna look at efficacy, which means effectiveness, and then safety also. And when it says evidence-based, it means that they've done studies on this. And the studies need to show how many people, it needs to have a large amount of people in the study. Um, it also needs to include a placebo, which is um, something that looks like a drug but has no active ingredient because there's a thing called the placebo effect, which uh, basically means that if people believe that they're taking something into their body to make them feel better, they're going to report that they feel better even though they didn't do anything to, um, it's not because of the placebo, they'll think that it was though. So that's a placebo effect. So, dr so the best studies need to include um, the drug that's being investigated, a placebo and a control, which is another drug to treat that that's already out there that we know how well it works. So you're gonna compare the new drug against the placebo and against your control drug. So, um, I like to see what kind of studies are done on new drugs, how many people are in the study, and what they compared it to, um, and that to me is really interesting. Martindale's The Complete Drug Reference. This provides information on drugs in clinical use worldwide, as well as selected investigational and veterinary drugs, herbal and complementary medicines, pharmaceutical excipients, remember excipients, are the things that they put in a tablet that are not drug to hold it into its form. Now, um, some things that are excipients in oral solutions could be syrup, could be sugar, could be a sweetener like glycerin or sorbitol that is not sugar. Um, and some people have a reaction to those things. So then they might think they're allergic to the drug when actually they're allergic to an excipient. Um, so Martindale's complete drug reference shows those excipients as well as vitamins and nutritional agents and vaccines. It's a good source for checking on exceptions to regular medications and, of course, available in hardback or electronic format now. Remington's Pharmaceutical Sciences, The Science and Practice of Pharmacy. This is actually a textbook for pharmacy schools. So if you finish this course and you work as a technician for a while and you decide to become a pharmacist, you'll be looking at this book a lot because it's used, as far as I know, in all of the pharmacy schools um, in our area. It covers the entire scope of pharmacy, including the history of pharmacy, ethics, and the specifics of industrial pharmacy and community pharmacy practice, manifestations, and pathophysiology of diseases. Manifestations means what do they look like? And pathophysiology is how does it chemically affect the body? 
immunology and disease state management, specialization in pharmacy practice, professional communication, various aspects of patient care. Um, pharmacists use this reference when they prepare for a counseling session and compounding pharmacies use it for product information on topics like storage and stability. This is available in hardback format. I don't know if they now have an online, I know they have an online presence, but I don't know if there's a subscription that you can use to access it or not. Okay, uh, additional pharmacy reference books. There are all kinds of books that are out there that are sold to the public. And what they'll say is, what they don't want you to know. And by they, they mean the government or the drug companies because they're implying that the, there's a big conspiracy, that secrets are being kept. But if you buy their book, you will find out that eating garlic helps lower your cholesterol. Well, uh, countries like Germany have done studies on the effect of cholesterol, on the effect of garlic with cholesterol. Um, and it does lower cholesterol a tiny amount. Um, and you would have to eat a whole lot of it to lower your cholesterol a lot. And so garlic for most people is not a, um, a good alternative to drugs that lower cholesterol or changing your diet to lower your cholesterol. So um, kind of stay away from those for the most part, especially if they want you to buy more things at the end of the book, because then you know that they just wrote the book to promote their product that they're trying to sell. So things that are legitimate additional reference books are the Pediatric and Neonatal Dosage Handbook. This is, um, we have that in Children's Hospital. Suggested dosages for pediatric patients. The Geriatric Dosage Handbook. Um, and of course, every hospital uh, that treats patients that are elderly have a Geriatric Dosage Handbook. Because what happens is as patients get older, especially as after the age of like 70, their organs start to atrophy and they start to harden. So they don't process drugs the way that they used to. So patients maybe need to have their dosage actually lowered or they might have to be raised depending um, on their age. And they have something called the beers criteria. Um, and it has nothing to do with drinking beer. It's the name of the criteria. Um, so this uh, geriatric dosage handbook will have that information in there and other specialty reference books, drugs that can be used in pregnancy and breastfeeding, psychotropic medications, so those are medications that affect the psyche or the brain and the way that people think and act, and antibiotics. So um, let me see if page 169, nope, it's going to be page, Uh, page 164, table 7-4, a uh, list of major pharmacy reference books. Now, um, a technician needs to have his or her own reference books, especially when you first start working. One of them is called Pocket Pharmacopoeia, and that one I like, and it has like three different sizes that are different prices, and they, they are, some of them are really tiny, and all it lists is the brand and generic name. Um, and then they have a little bit bigger one that would fit in a lab coat pocket. And it, that one also contains classifications, indications, and side effects. Um, you, they, they need to be updated yearly because these things change all the time. But um, most of the time, the drugs that are listed are gonna have the same generic name for the next 100 years. They're not going to change their generic name. They may change their brand name, but they won't change the generic name. So these things are good things to have in your pocket. There are a lot of electronic references. There used to be something called a PDA, which <clears throat> was a personal, personal data, something or other. It was an electronic tablet. But now that you don't need a separate PDA and a smartphone or, or and a, a cell phone. Okay, they used to be two different things. And now, of course, everybody's phone, you know, is a smartphone and you can access all of this stuff if you have internet access by your phone. Um, so drug guides can be downloaded. These devices are small enough to carry in your pocket. They also come on CD-ROMs if you have an older computer that uses those. 
So the common apps that uh, people use, Epocrates is one, Meds Medscape Mobile, Micromedics Drug, drug Information, uh, Mobile PDR, and Fingertip Formulary. So those are all things that you can access from your phone, besides Google, of course. So how, when you're going online and you Google something, how do you determine whether that information is reliable? Look at who's publishing it, who is putting it on the internet. If it's provided by a professional organization, it's reliable. Information based on opinions might not be accurate and should be avoided. Okay, so now the problem is that a lot of these people that put their opinion out there or their anecdote or their, they have an agenda they want to push, they will come up with an internet presence name that sounds something like Safe and Secure Medicines or American Society for, I don't know, Natural Medicines or something. So then you look at that and you're like, oh, American Society is national. It must be a good thing when actually it could be one person in their basement, right? Um, and saying things like eat a grape for a headache. This dog is annoying me. He annoys me every time I get online because I'm talking to something and it's not him. So he wants attention but it's okay, he's a good boy. Okay, so there are helpful websites out there that are, are good to use. And box 7.3 are associations that provide continuing education and information, as well as table 7.2, websites and databases helpful for pharmacy technicians, and that's on page 163. Okay, it's 163. So I have the wrong um, page listed on this PowerPoint. I apologize. Note to myself, update the PowerPoint. Okay. Journals and news magazines. Um, these are all online now, but you can still get some journals in paper form. Some of them will send you a paper form. Uh, almost every pharmacy will subscribe to some of these journals. One of them is called Drug Topics. One is called the, um, uh, what is it called? Community Pharmacy News. Um, the Journal of the American Medical Association. You know, there's quite a few of those. Journals offer continuing ed education to certified technicians at a reasonable cost. Um, sometimes they'll put out free CE. Now, once you pass the pharmacy technician certification board, once you pass that exam and you get certified, you're gonna have to do 20 units every two years. So if you can look on some of these websites for free continuing education, that's the way to go. And I managed to get all 20 units in the last two years for free by doing that because I am very cheap. I'm sorry, I'm frugal. I'm frugal, I'd rather spend my $50 on something else. Um, and a lot of technicians that I know will pay $49.99 to, um, to companies that will give them like 30 units so they can choose 20 of them. And, you know, I'd rather see what's out there that's free and save my $49.99. Okay, so um, a lot of these news magazines contain articles on new drugs, technicians, the future of pharmacy, and various legislative changes. Um, and then journals written by pharmacy technician associations are geared specifically to technician issues, but sometimes your pharmacy won't subscribe to them. And a lot of these journals can be accessed on the internet. There are a lot of associations that you can join, and I think we talked about some of these already in chapter four. Um, this is a good source of information and a way to network. Some associations will provide CE. Now, I'm not gonna say it's free because if you join the association, you pay yearly or you pay for a two-year subscription. Um, so you are paying for some of this, but, um, you know, you need to take advantage of these things that come with your subscription. Professional associations that include pharmacy technicians are NPTA, which is National Pharmacy Technician Association, AAPT, American Association of Pharmacy Technicians, ASHP, American, so American Society of Health System Pharmacy, 
APHA, American Pharmacists Association, and Society for the Education of Pharmacy Technicians. That one is free to students. They have seminars and sometimes they'll do CE dinners. So you have to go to that dinner and uh, most of those you pay for, but some are sponsored by drug companies. So you can use it for CE, but just realize that the drug companies are trying to sell their drugs because that's how they stay in business, right? Okay, so here's some websites on these things. Um, normally associations provide a way to order reference books, often at reduced membership rates and Table 7-4 is a list of additional reference books for pharmacy technicians, and that's on page 164, so I need to update those numbers. Okay, so when it says that if you join a pharmacy association, it's a good source of information and a good way to network. Okay, when they're talking about networking, they're talking about the people that also work in your field that you can sort of socialize with, but in a very professional manner. Um, so if you go to say a conference or a, um, an expo or one of those things, sometimes you pay a lot of money to go to these conferences, but you meet a lot of people that are in your same field. And some of them you can end up being good friends with later in life. So um, networking also means that like if they have a job opening and they'll say, hey, I remember you know, Joey lives in this area. Maybe I should call this person and see if they want to apply for this job. So networking is getting to be more the way that people find jobs than just, you know, cold applying or looking online and, and applying. Um, so that's what they mean by networking. This enables the technician to stay current on drugs, devices, and pharmacy issues. They offer reduced rates on necessary books. They have divisions specifically for pharmacy technicians. One of the good ones is ASHP has a technician division. And so if you join, it's cheaper than if you were a pharmacist because they know pharmacy technicians don't make as much as pharmacists. And then uh, they charge them accordingly, but they also offer continuing education for pharmacists. And they also, one of the benefits is new ways to learn about CE and drug topics. And you also find out which, um, which areas are using specific drugs based on what the, the particular doctors will um, prescribe. So you learn things like, oh, we're using a whole lot of this antibiotic for this particular condition. Really, that's interesting, you know, things like that. Uh, when you're choosing a reference, if you want generic and trade names, indications, and side effects, drug facts and comparisons is a good source. Um, employees can have complimentary use of some of these electronic subscriptions. Check with bookstores to find older editions at reduced prices. Consider size and accessibility, look for pocket size versions, and avoid books that reference drugs only one way. However, smaller books often have smaller print that might be harder to read. So if it's a, a, a pocket-sized book, just make sure that it's not teeny tiny print. Choosing the correct reference helps save time and avoid frustration. As pharmacies update their reference books, you might be able to obtain a free copy of some print references. I wonder where I got this one from because they, get, they need to update it every year or every time it comes out. So what do they do with the old ones? They give it to the school, right? Okay. Um, if the book has what you're looking for and it's easy to read, you're gonna use it more often, okay? All right, do you have any questions? Okay, so um, what we're going to do here for chapter seven for homework is in the um, in the workbook and lab manual, the questions at the end of the chapter, the uh, terms and definitions, true or false, multiple choice, matching on page 83 and page 84. And then in the short answer, I believe I picked 
uh, one and three or three and five. Anyway, it's on your module in Canvas, so it tells you that. And there's also something else in your module on Canvas and your, um, your quiz on acronyms and abbreviations number 21 through 40 is open. And also, I believe your chapter five quiz is open as well. So uh, you can take the quiz for chapter five. So um, any questions? Okay. Uh, I did send out an announcement stating that we were going to do chapter seven and chapter two before we do chapter eight, because chapter eight is all about community pharmacy, which is what this whole class is about. And so um, knowing about your references is important. And um, also knowing about the laws is extremely important. You have to know the most important laws for what you're doing. So in our case, it's, you know, pharmacy. Now, the pharmacy, California pharmacy law book is over 265 pages. The last time I downloaded it from the Board of Pharmacy. Um, and the Board of Pharmacy website is pharmacy.ca.gov, G-O-V. And you can Download it yourself if you want, if you have room on your device to put it, but you don't really need to because um, most of what you need to know is in chapter two and then laws specifically relating to California, um, I'm gonna tell you guys about because it's, uh, it's pretty important if you're gonna work in California. Uh, things like in California, technicians are not allowed to take a new prescription over the phone from anybody at a doctor's office, not even from the doctor. We have to hand the phone to the pharmacist. And usually what we do is we say, okay, my pharmacist will be right with you. I'm going to place you on a brief hold, put them on hold. You tell the pharmacist, I have a doctor with a new prescription online, whatever. And they usually pick it up pretty quickly if it's a new prescription. So that's not in your book because that's a California thing and we're using books that are national and they're, they're good books. So we use them and we supplement. Um, so we are allowed at uh, this school and most schools to supplement up to 25% of our curriculum with our experience, which is why they like experienced technicians to teach the classes because we know things like California law, um, things like that. So, um, Anyway, if you have any other questions, you know you can email me and, um, and I'll put the information up in Canvas and be sure to check in with Canvas often and check your announcements and your emails, okay? All right.